Rob Waterhouse, welcome, welcome to the Wolf Den. Thank you very much, Rich. Um, great to have you here. So let's let's start with a bang. Uh, was Bill Waterhouse, your father, the biggest gambler Australia has ever seen? Oh, people say that I never heard my father claim that, but obviously he was a, a huge bookmaker. But I suppose I think more importantly, he was a, a big bookmaker uh, for seventy years. It, yeah. He lasted a long time and, and better than. Dogs and the trotting and the the gallops. Yep. On his stage, on locals and led the ring in Melbourne, led the ring in Sydney. Uh, he most certainly had longevity. I've worked uh, in England with the English Derby, and the Queensland Course, Royal Ascot. I've been to Vegas, talked with the gamblers there, with the legalised bookmakers in the state of Nevada. You couldn't compare the betting that goes on elsewhere in the world with what goes on in the rails of Ramwick. And at the very centre of the centre is Bill Waterhouse. Um, well, yes, I suppose you'd say that, yes. Do you have an image of yourself as the biggest bookmaker in Australia? I don't think of it that way. I've never, ever, you know, looked upon it that way. But uh, it's what I, I bet. Now, I don't know how long you'll be up top. Because it's a question of uh, what's inside. If your nerve cracks, you're finished. Uh, you'll still probably kick on, but your gambling will be gone. And a bookmaker's only got a, a gambling bookmaker's only got a certain time at the top. And I feel as though I've had uh, more than my share there, perhaps. And uh, how long I can last, I can't answer that. I, I saw in another podcast that you weren't allowed to go to the races until you were 16. Is that right? No, Dad, was, Dad didn't want me to go to the races. Yeah, and so you finally. Dad, Dad took the view that, um, contrary to most industries, we've sons go very well in the same industry as their father. Uh, Dad had seen too many bookmaker sons go very badly. Yes. He wanted me to stay away until until uh, I was 16, able to get a clerk's licence. Yeah, and how many generations of book bookmakers are in the Waterhouse family? Well, Dad's father got a bookmaker's licence in 1889. Yeah. And there might have been at illegal meetings, uh, which there were lots of in those days, uh, there might have been family members betting earlier at those. Yeah. So you were 16 when you first were allowed to go to the races and yes. I reckon that was about 1970. Yeah. What I'd love to do is find out a bit about what his business was like back then. Was it at probably at its peak then in 1970? Uh, I suppose my father and his brother would say, oh, if you only seen the good days, gee, it's tough now. It's this no, is in 1970? In 19, oh, look, wow. You've got no idea. This is, this is so dreadful it's just so much tough money around it's it's no loose money not like the good days okay so all right well that, that's interesting and kenny, and kenny ranger who was the, the biggest bookmaker in australia in his time uh he retired in 1952 and declared in the paper in an interview the game was totally gone it just wasn't the most Sorry, what you, when did he retire 1952 <laughs> <laughs> wow wow so well let's go so back to a long death yeah let's go uh, a long death Let's go back to, say, 1970 and you're 16 yes. and Saturday morning what happens? Like you, well, you're in the family home and you wake up and then well, uh, what I, I think I suppose, people will find fascinating I suppose is when I, since I was 10, I'd go with Dad to the office uh, on a, a Saturday morning and I'd listen to all his telephone calls and write down prices he, he got from various sources. And I suppose it should be said that he had quite a big – I don't say it was a – a huge business financially, but he had quite a big business betting pre-post. Yes. People betting with him. And that gave him great insight. And were you allowed to do that or just you weren't but everybody did it? Yeah. The, the Game Betting Act is still very uh, arcane and uh, Dad was once charged with taking bets pre-post and won it because he said I was going to execute a mission, commission at the race course. Right. And I guarantee them a price and yeah. then won the case. So, look, I, I think it was legal but I'm yeah. sure – that the AJC would have taken a dim view at the time. Did And did this – was your dad a form student in the sense that he sat down and put a price to each horses or did he put prices to horses by getting prices from other people and then taking bets and letting that shape the market? I think it was the best of both worlds because dad was a, a form student and as a university student used to construct markets and bet off them. But he knew he was no good at it. Right. So he'd, he'd go through the – he'd actually – before he spoke to anyone else, he'd actually go through and do a market every race. Yes. 
but okay. realised that he yeah. wasn't... To, to find out how wrong he actually was. Yeah. Well, uh, well, also to sort of give himself some sort of feeling and to understand yes. what people were saying and that sort of thing. You know, he, he most certainly wasn't egotistical in the sense that he uh, thought that he was a, the judge to be taking people on to him, but the, he would say things that were quite sensible at times and take account of his own views. Yeah, and so you're at the office... And so did, I must say, also uh, Dad's brother, Jack. He was a keen form student, had two full-time people working with him. And whenever he said he didn't like a horse, gee, that a poor record. Yes, yes. Mm. But would you, your father wouldn't do the form as fastidiously as you do these days. Would that be fair to say? No, I think it's fair. It's quite fair. Yes, it's fair to say. He'd, he'd do a set of prices, but it'd take him yes. three hours to do them. Sort of thing. It was, uh, probably but, takes me and, ten uh, hours for me. And you guys are different styles of bookies anyway, aren't you? I mean, the world's so different now. Mm. Um, mm. But what I, I want to go back to a day in the life of Bill in 1970. Yes. So, um, and was the... Family offices still in North Sydney? Is that where the offices were? We've always moved, been around North Sydney. I suppose uh, we were down in Milton's Point and a great office in, uh, in Milton's Point and then another one in Kirribilli. Then we moved up to the Pacific Highway. Uh, so we'd moved around a bit but by and large we were, we were always in that area. Yeah, so you got your clerk's licence and would you drive out to the races with him? Uh, I'd actually go with my cousin. I worked, Dad wanted me to work with my cousin. He was actually in the ledger. At uh, the race at that time, right? Uh, my uh, so your your cousin was working in the ledger, John and, Waterhouse, and you'd work for him. Yes, I'd, and I'd right. worked. Uh, I had a different job every day during the school holidays. Uh, I'd uh, work on the bag on a Saturday. I'd be on the right tickets another day. I'd do something else. I'd be on the ground. I did, did everything. Yeah, and so when Bill was going to the races back then, how much cash would he take on a on a day like that? Just just to give us a scale of the betting he was mm. up to then because it was obviously no electronic transfers or anything. If you wanted to bet, you had to bet in cash. Well, I suppose there's a great story. Uh, our head clerk was a man called Keith Jones who was a large-in-life character and fa a fantastic person. And um, we had uh, 40000 in uh, $20, which was the largest note in those days, which is like two loaves of bread sitting on the desk. And Keith said, which was very nice of him, he picked up half a dozen big betting books do you want me to take this cash as well? And Dad said, oh, that'd be a good idea. Yeah, he put the cash in his briefcase. The betting books were quite hard. He might have picked up some tickets as well. He walked down the stairs of our offices in North Sydney, across the Pacific Highway, opened up his boot and put the bag down the ground, put the bags in the boot and whatever else he was carrying. Unfortunately, he closed the boot, got in his car and drove off and left the briefcase. Oh, no. At the back of the car. <laughs> Four years walking down the street and actually watched him walk out of our building. Saturday morning, no one else yeah. was there. They picked up the briefcase, which was unlocked, walked across the road, came into our, came up the stairs of our office, knocked on the door and said, could someone, do you know any of this briefcase? Someone's left it on the road. Did wow. you? I'll give it to them, I said. <laughs> <laughs> wow, so it was 40,000. Yes, and, and they were, uh, look, um, uh, you know, that was for, for all the joints we had. My uncle Jack, who was the largest turnover in Australia for, for 30 years, uh, betting on the interstate. You had Dad who was betting on the locals. You had Cousin John who was in the, the paddock. And my cousin Charlie who was betting in the ledger. So, you know, it was to cover, it was a bank for everyone. So yes. So yeah. 40,000 sort of saw everybody out back then. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I guess you, for really big betting, you'd settle via check and that kind of thing. Yeah. And how many, so Bill's, so in 1970, he was on the rails in Sydney, uh, in the, um, local rails, that yes. is, sorry. Yeah. And how many how many staff would he have working for him? Dad never had many staff. Uh, you weren't allowed to be uh, on the member's side as a clerk. Mm. He had Keith Jones, who I mentioned a moment ago. He was the nod clerk in charge of all nod bits. He'd be leaning over the fence. Dad would have a, uh, a, a clerk to write down the, uh, the all the cash bits and a, a bagman and... Uh, Someone on the ground, and would he have huge credit betting? A lot of a lot of people betting credit. Yeah, him? yeah. Well, it, credit's just a thing of the past now. I, I I don't think I've had a new client come to me on the race course wanting credit for yeah tenure. It just isn't something happening. And it's it probably it a good thing, right? It's easy. Yeah, I just don't know. I wish they were there, but they're they're not. Yeah, and what was what was a big day or a good day? Like are we in the hundreds oh. of thousands or? Oh, well, it could be. Uh, um, I remember one day uh, raining over the carnival. Dad won over a million dollars in the day. Uh, yeah. So, you know, that was... Uh, it's big money was, back then. Big money, yeah. yeah. Mm. Well, Dad held more than the tote on, on the on-course tote when the tote was yeah. betting properly. 
Yeah, extraordinary. Mm. And w- at the end of a Saturday was a particular restaurant where he would go to and all the, the racing gentry would go to. But well, I'm the, sure it's long the, closed since. I'd wait at the office half to the, uh, for Dad to come back from the races. Uh, and uh, Keith Jones' dad and I would sit down, we'd do the, the, the settling, mm. which would take an hour and a half or two hours. A- and we had a reputation for getting it always right, which was because of the three of us doing it. Uh, and I must say, Dad was the, the best of the three of us by far. Uh, and then so you're going through the ledger, the, the, the pencil know, ledger? The, and having to transfer to work out... The, what everyone's figure is, yeah. What everyone's figure All is. the credit yeah. figures for all the different yeah. clients, and yeah. A lot of it was each way and it was a bit complicated. And, what it was. and we'd also do my Uncle Jack's and my cousin John's. Yeah. Uh, certainly the, the three of them would be all done at the same time. So, you know, it was uh, that was a big job. It takes an hour and a half or two hours. Uh, and then we'd go up. We had several restaurants to go to, uh, but we just go there on our own with Keith and yeah, cracked so there wasn't yeah it wasn't a, it wasn't like the Great Gatsby there wasn't no, like no. yeah okay much more humble than that very humble humble <laughs> um, and to, to finish off Bill what who did he have the biggest tussles with the biggest battles with obviously there's the Philippe Ismail and yeah those oh. kind of was the one that really stood out. Well, a person stands out all the time. He's such an extraordinary man. It was Ray Hopkins. Yes. Ray Hopkins just dominated racing for 30 or 40 years, didn't he? And mm. Got up and down, up and down, up and down. So he was sort of – he'd sort of retired, for want of a better term. I came yeah. into the game like 25 years ago. Yeah, yeah. And he had um, sort of – from of what I could see, sort of stopped betting. But yeah. everyone talked about him being – Well, um, he was the they when they said they've back so-and-so. When you look, drill down, you actually found it was Ray. Right. So he was incredibly, he was incredibly well collect, connected but also a, was he a very good gambler? Um, I think he was a good judge. I'm not saying he wasn't uh, well connected. He, he most certainly paid a lot of attention to Trackman. Uh, and I'd say he had a flaw. He wasn't a terribly good gambler. But, um, but that might be – you might disagree with me. Yeah. And um, did your dad fear him as a, as a punter? Well, Dad looked for his business, but but he most certainly respected him very much, and he was to be respected. You know, he was a uh, a tough punter, I suppose. Uh, he used to always bet with Dad first because mm-hmm. Dad had a bit of a decent bet. But he had Dad had a very uh, in those days we had boards with knobs on them, and they'd turn the knob the price down or whatever. And Dad, whatever Ray backed, Dad always turned the knob of a different horse down. Really? Ray to, thought that was a great thing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. To, 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 for everyone who's standing in the ring trying to see what happened. That's smart. That's funny. Ray thought it was the best thing of all time. <laughs> and then would everyone go and try and back the wrong horse? Oh, they would, yeah. Yeah, yeah they'd rush funny. 100 miles an hour. Yeah. Um, and who do you think – did Ray beat your dad because your dad led him to because it helped your dad? I don't think he did. Look, I think dad was hard to beat. Uh, when I was 16 or 17, I'd read an, an article in the um, – I think it was the National Times of the Bulletin on Don Scott. And I said, Dad, uh, you know, we should meet this Don Scott. And, you know, Dad rang him up and said, can we come and see you? Uh, and he said at that meeting, he said, here are the figures I've gone with all the bookmakers. Um, I've uh, won 105,000 Lenny Burke and yeah. I've lost 98,000 to you over the last year or two years or whatever else. I think that was hard to beat. I think that yes, was, that's that was That was going to stand the horse at the bottom of the market all the time. Mm. He wasn't a top odds bookmaker. He just wanted to stand the horse, the Titan at the bottom of the market. Um, so Don thought that was, was hard to beat. Mm. And if I walked up to Bill Waterhouse in 1970 and said, Bill, I want to have $100 on number one with you at $2.50, but if it runs second to tenth, I want you to give me a hundred, a free $100 bet back. What do you reckon he would have said to that? Well, I suppose the best way to answer that is I remember the races were off one day and we decided to sit at home and let some clients bet with us. And one of the clients said to Keith Jones, I want to bet, but I, I want to get 5% commission, which was quite easy to get from SP bookmakers. Wow. Yeah. And I remember Dad saying to Keith, Keith, anyone that knows about commission, we don't want the betting. <laughs> <laughs> I think that answers the question <laughs> adequately then. Um, so you mentioned Don Scott. So let's sort of move to when you became a bookie in your own right. So at 18, you got your licence. I did. It seems like you, you've always been a student of the form. And mm. did you – how did you learn to do the form? Was it through your father or was it through your own study and mentors like somebody like Don Scott? Well, uh, I was lucky enough to have Don Scott uh, doing a set of prices where he worked 
How old was Don Scott when you were 18? How old was Don Scott? I suppose he would have been 45 or something. Right, so he was a lot older, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, no, he was – perhaps he was only 40. Uh, But I worked up the the Northern Line, Newcastle on some Saturdays and then Scone, Musselbrook, Denman or Cessnock the other days and Don was going to do a set of prices for me, which was was a big help. Yeah, right. And was, was Don Scott – he was never a bookie though, Don Scott, was he? He was just always a punter? Um, well, that's true. But I went away on holidays and uh, I was a bookmaker in Canberra, betting on the interstate. And I said to Don flippantly, would you like to run my stand in Canberra? Oh, he said, I'd like to do that very much. <laughs> Which he, he did and then he, he won it. But I must say the tales were quite harrowing because he would dislike a horse very much to be six to four – and he'd put it straight up fours. <laughs> There'd be a huge queue around. He bet them all. <laughs> and and get beat. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well done, Don. <laughs> Wouldn't he be? He could have easily put it up at two to Was one, it? right? Well, it, it just seemed mad to me. But he, yeah. uh, I'm sure he would say, I had the horse marked 20s and I knew I'd get lots of business at the four to one. So I'd, and I'd mm. got all the money. Was he hugely influential in learning to do the form? I suppose you played some part. I don't think that, I don't think that Don actually was um, revolution in any way, shape or form. I think Don would even say that. Uh, I think Don's greatest skill was that uh, his proportional betting. I think that was a major breakthrough. And really it's a simple form of Kelly, which all the groups use. But I think that was his cleverest thing, betting for so much on the ticket. Yes, yes, betting to win a certain amount. Or yes, and then whatever price is, put that amount on it. Yeah, okay, I understand. Yes, yes, got you. Yes, got you. Uh, yes. betting for 100 on the ticket, you get $40 on it if it's... Six to four, or it's ten to one. Yes, yeah, uh, yeah, I think so that you, was. Yes. I don't, I haven't heard of anyone else doing that before he yeah. invented it, yeah. and I reckon that was very revolutionary. Yeah. So uh, you made a quote in this another podcast I listened to. You made a quote which I thought was quite interesting, and the quote was: "A horse is a horse. A horse is not its most recent run." Yes. Well, I must say I did plagiarize that quote. Yes. No. You please tell us who said it. Yeah. Yeah. Or yeah. well, Phil Bull had it in his office. Yes. Phil Ball was a terribly nice person. He had his office and it, it said a horse is a horse, a horse. What is his office? Is in the general office because uh, his view was that a horse was a, a – fitted in someone put in bad runs and good runs but as a punter you had your success by backing the horse that, that ran poorly last time. Yes. Not yes. to dismiss them. Yes, because you need to you need to look at a horse that might be able to run a peak rating in a race coming mm. up that the market has – Mispriced, in, in, being able to do that pig rating. He published things in the late 30s and every year he, he sold tips. Every year he showed a, a flat stake profit. But he went through the wins he'd had and every one of those wins had run a poor race the, the previous – every big win he'd had had won a poor race previously. Yeah, interesting. Um, let's talk about TJ Smith. So yeah. you must have – TJ Smith must have started to come into your world at this time in well, the sense that uh, he would have <laughs> – Gay, Gay, and, Gay and, uh, my wife Gay and I started to go out and uh, I always got on very well with Tommy. Uh, you know, he disapproved all Gay's other boyfriends and thought I was okay. And, and I must say I learned a lot from him. He was so smart, so understood racing so well and been involved in all parts of racing. You know, he was really an absolute star. And was he a pretty prolific punter himself? Look, as a young man he depended on punting for a living uh, but, uh, of course, they discovered the trick of actually finding people to give the odds to something, which I, I think he was very skillful at. Yes, yeah. And he did he sort of set the, the Smith family up a little bit? I hear stories that he'd have a big win back in the 50s and the 60s and then go down the road and, and buy a shop in Double Bay or something like that. Was that a...? Yes, well, he most certainly, most certainly uh, was lucky enough to buy a lot of property and every time he, he had good success, he bought another block of flats or something, yeah, yeah. which is, yeah, good. which is very very sensible. Absolutely, yeah. Mm. Bit bit harder to do in today's world, but um, yeah, yeah. Well, it's because the money's so small. That's the yes. problem. Yeah. Um, and then so you're bookmaking for quite a period of time, and then 1984 comes along, and you get in a bit of trouble, and you basically get told that you can't do your profession, your chosen profession yeah. anymore. Well, look. I must say, whilst it was devastating at the time, uh, it made me concentrate on uh, betting and betting, taking exotics and whatever else. 
And I suspect if I hadn't, I would have disappeared the way all my contemporaries did. Yes. I think it was the best thing that happened. Yeah. And can you talk – so when you say your contemporaries, who, who exactly were they? Are they the other – Well, um, my good friend Dominic Byrne, you know, he lasted, I think, 86. Uh, Peter Todd was a leading bookmaker. He didn't uh, last that much longer than that. Um, uh, the, Roger Manning was the, the top holder of the races. Uh, he disappeared about the same time. And why? What? What became difficult about the game that they no longer could well, make, the game it, make just, it profitable? Just, just, just toughened up. I think I made a list of uh, from nineteen ninety five. There were seventeen leading bookmakers. Yeah, and with the exception of David Dwyer, who's a great bookmaker, uh, they all went broke. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's a tough business. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And so for that, you were basically a professional punter. So you you were off track for seventeen years, then yeah. or fourteen mm. years, and I think it took you a couple of years yeah. to get your license back. But so yeah, so what did life look like? You were doing the form conscientiously, just, just consciously doing the form. I suppose I had a breakthrough in the, I think it was the um, late seventy seventy nine. They introduced trifectas, and. Um, my best license, even though I was on the rails at the races, my best license was my trotting license. Mm. Uh, they'd get more people on the coldest, wettest night of the year at Harold Park than they'd get for the Golden Slipper. Isn't that funny? Just wow. extraordinary. Yeah. They get zero to, to the biggest night of the year at the trots, they get zero. Zero. I'm an angle now, yeah. No zero. Yeah. Zero. Uh, you know, there was a, uh, a horse, I think it was Power Face Ice, I'm not sure what it was, but mm. it was in the, they had one traffic to race a night. It was in the last race, which and you were bookmaking right at this time. Yep. Yeah, you know, it was assessed as being a threes on chance, and I put it up two to five at a dollar forty, uh, four to nine dollar forty four, one to two, and you know, I got it to evens, and I wrote a, a column or a column and a half of bets, which was a lot of bets to mm. write, but all tiny bets. And I was, I got, I reckon I got two thousand one hundred and sixty out of it, and I was really disappointed. There was no one there to back it. Uh, it was resuming from a from a spell. And the reports from Jim Carnes was that it was very ordinary. Yeah. I got the back of the race book and I wrote down um, a list of numbers and then cross sectioned it quite quite quickly and what else and backed uh, and backed uh, lots of trifectas, mm. leaving it out of a place, mm. which you know I couldn't see the sense of backing it second or third. Well, uh, I got back sixty three thousand or something. Yeah. Like, this is a lot better than giving evens. It's yeah, much better. yeah. <laughs> and you, did you need the money at the time? Did it? Did it? Oh, I suppose everyone needs money all the time. Yeah, they. Uh, everyone's got uses for money. It's sort of, yeah. No, it was it was great. But I, but I must say it was eye opening to me that that was a much better yes. thing to do. And I suppose it also taught me um, it, all the, tr- the computer groups defy the box players, mm. And, mm. and I, without thinking, had to defy the box players. And so you were you spent a lot of time betting the, the exotics while you're off, off track, is that right? Sort of oh, in the 1990s, oh, yeah. that, that was your main focus? That's that all I did. Mm. And was the Humbleton group coming along then? This is Jelko and David Walsh. Were they, were mm. they known by then? And did, did well, you... not when we started off, but I actually went to the book launch of David Walsh and it was a uh, funny thing, but the upshot of it is he, I bought 24 books, I think, but he wrote in mine. A lo- we never actually made eye contact. He's an unusual man, a very mm. nice man, unusual. Uh, he never should be read the longest two two pages and saying oh, I was the first, but I'm not saying I'm just the right. first. But that was yeah. a nice thing for him to write. Yeah, very much. So. He might have said that you know we we learned a lot from you or something like that. And do you have you followed Hamilton's success very closely? Like, do you ever speak to Jelko and stuff? And uh, well, I've known Jelko for a long time, and um, I suppose every time I go to London, I always ring up and ask him for a cup of mm. to eat or something. Uh, and he's great. And people say he still doesn't miss a thing of what's happening in the game. No. He's, he knows everything that's going on and he's very yeah. involved. And yes, he, he, he yeah. really likes it. And um, if – yeah, he, he really likes it. And the, there's certain triggers he wants to be aware of. And it, please wake me up at 3.30 in the morning if one of these triggers happens. What's the chance of getting him to do a podcast? Oh, it's certain to. Really? But not, not in this world, in the next right. world. In the, in the next lifetime? Yes. Yeah, okay. We'll try for that. Um, and then just on the syndicates, quite yes. extraordinary that – so the Humbleton group seem like they're a once-in-a-lifetime group of punters, right? 
would never be emulated again. And then you've got Dr. Nick and his son, Dominic, who I don't know. I know Dr. Nick a little bit, never met his son. But it's extraordinary that they've come along and been able to be what seems as just as successful as the Humboldt Group and make more money than God, basically. Um, but better. there are others too, aren't there? Of course. But I'm just sort of yeah. looking at the local, just our local little world. But, I mean, who are some well, of the other groups well, that have had incredible success? Well, there are two Woods groups and they're one particular goes very well. The Phoenix, is that the Phoenix Group? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then there's the, the uh, man without mentioning his name because you might want to say, I was fascinated to read um, a little dog meeting back in the 90s. Uh, late at night, there was a dog that should have been 100 right on or 20 right on or something. You know, they've manipulated the totes. Might have been for the place. And under the Queensland, all they always had to pay uh, a, a dividend of mm. five cents for the 50 cents. Uh, and they had to pay three ways. Where it was, the tote was out of pocket. 30% on their turnover mm. and they went to court to say we can't because we, we're not allowed to lose. And they said, but they rules. Yeah. And he, he, so, the, that, that particular man is a, the, a huge Betfair player in Australia and other places. Yeah, right. Um, where are we going to – yeah, so what I wanted to do was talk a little bit now about your approach to doing the form now. Mm. So All Age Stakes is on Saturday, yep. All Age Stakes meeting. So if you can just sort of take us through – the process you go through um, of when you download the form, how much of it is done by computer, how much is of you manually um, assessing everything? I, I don't think what I do is terribly special uh, and have done the same thing the same way for a long time. Uh, I suppose my first task is, is to go back and look at the last start of every horse racing around Australia and say how strong is that form, what do we know about the form? And where does it now fit? Is this and every horse that's racing at Randwick on Saturday or...? Every every, everywhere. Right, so you look at you take the time to look at every horse that races every day? Just just at the, the actual race, that's all. Yeah. The race it comes out of. Yeah. And have I over underestimated that race and I just keep adjusting it. Yeah. And have you started that process for Saturday's Randwick uh, meeting? Of, uh, yes, and, and for all the other meetings in New South Wales and all the meetings in Victoria, South Australia. On Saturday? Yes. On Saturday. And, and you I'll do that, you don't, a computer doesn't help you do that? Surely a computer must help you do that. I think I do a better job. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Super um, interesting. Uh, and I'll do Sunday tonight. Wow. And Sunday then tonight. when will you actually put a price to every runner at Randwick on Saturday? Uh, I'll, tomorrow I'll get to the office and I'll start working on the form. And a lot of what I call is donkey work, but I'll, I'll do the price. Last thing I won't look at anything else says. And I can't look at the price. And I suppose... The last thing I'll do is look at the betting market and try and work out why they people think the way they think and if they're right or and I'm mm. wrong or vice versa. And do you find that your prices are often wildly different to what the Oh, very different. But yeah. but very often they're hundred percent right. Yeah. And you can see why they're right. And yeah. What time do you will you wake up on Saturday to finish the form off? Oh, I hear geez. rumors that you wake up at like three AM. Yeah, well, you 3, and Gay thirty. Really? Well Gay, Gay gets up at two always getting up at two fifteen. Yeah. Uh, and She's uh, – Gay doesn't trust herself hearing the alarm clocks. It's my job to wake her. Um, what time do you wake up this morning? Uh, we were up at 3.30. Wow. Sleep in. Mm. Is that like that pretty much every morning? Most mornings, yeah. Wow. I did come from Melbourne, I must say, this morning, but it's – yes. Yeah. And a quick question on the current horse's animo. If, uh, if Gay trained animo and she said, Rob, should I send it to Ascot? Yeah. Would you be sending it? Well, I'd like to send anything to Ascot, but I, I suppose our advantage is with the uh, short course uh, horses mm -hmm. and uh, unfortunately Animos is best at 2,000 metres and I think their horses are better than our horses at 2,000 yeah. metres or more. And 2,000 metres at Ascot, or 600, I think it's going for the, is it the Queen Anne, uh, 600 metres, it's really like 2,200 metres. Mm. You know, yes, because it's that, that big. That, that huge rise, just extraordinary. Mm. So you wouldn't send him? You'd say, no, Gay, let's yeah, well, let, let him have a nice sum, yeah, uh, nice well, spell in Queensland. Yeah, yeah, well, I think so. Yeah, fair enough. Um, so let's let's talk about Gay. So you're married to a national treasure. She's a national yeah. treasure. And she actually, the, when they found the national treasures, she actually polled the highest of anyone, which I just find it extraordinary. We didn't know it was, even though it was yeah. the, the poll. I didn't vote. I would have voted. <laughs> but, but, but to be the poll, the highest poll of the 100 national treasures was gay. Really? Well, extraordinary. She's, she's a very famous woman. I mean, yeah, but had been famous for a long time, yeah. hasn't she? And yeah. Well-liked and she's a very nice person. Yeah. 
and um, she still seems just as motivated to continue to train mm. winners as ever. Well, she's uh, she was considering uh, retiring fully because she's in love with her grandchildren, isn't she? Mm. Uh, and I said that she shouldn't, but she should do exactly what she wants to do rather than what she you know feels obliged to do. So she spends all the time now with the horses. Yeah. It's better. Fantastic. And you've obviously Adrian's come on board. Mm. He's very impressive and doing very well. Adrian's fantastic. Yeah, he came in and did a podcast. So I was yeah, really I impressed by him. Mm. Yeah. Um, so Gay's obviously had a huge amount of success. She would, she's had a big team to help her achieve that success and you've played your role in that. I want to have a yeah. bit of a chat about especially some of the horses. She's had some incredible horses. First horse I wanted to talk about was Fioronte. So Fioronte won the 2013 Melbourne Cup, correct? Millie, so it's um, going to be... Uh, yes, it did. Uh, I mean, 2013, yes. So it's going to be 10 years this year. But mm. um, you, I presume you had a bit to do with getting it. So Fioronte was a it was imported from England. Um, we, Gay went over there with the, the idea to try and buy a stay that might start in Melbourne. And was that because she had a burning desire to train a Melbourne Cup winner or she had clients saying, hey... I think it's an easy thing to, to say to clients over this horse that might get in the Melbourne Cup and might win it. I think that's an easy thing to do. It's what it's what they're good at producing, mm. um, and we must have looked at two hundred horses in France, and Gay didn't looked like at any. them in person or in person. Yeah, we wow. all, this, all <laughs> the, the, the stay. Well, they, they show you. You go to one sale, they'll show you thirty horses. They're all for sale. Yeah. And you go to another one, they show you some more. They show you some more. Yeah. And she didn't like any of them. They weren't to her type. Uh, we saw a few horses, not as many, but a few horses in England. We went to the races. I think it was the New Market. I think it was the Princess of Wales Stakes. And in the enclosure, Gay said, uh, gee, that's a lovely horse. Oh, I'd love to train that horse. Gay, Gay fell in love with it on, on site. Um, I'd been for a jog that morning and I'd run up one side of Newmark, which is a long straight course, and come back down the other side. And it was much wetter on the sand side, which on the stand side, which there was a bit of a camber and you could see why it would be better. Well, of course, Fiorante came up the stand side, which was... Better and uh, I thought the run was terrific. Mm. And I said to Gay, "Look, we should make an offer for it." And what did it? Did it win or did it? Where did it run? Yeah, I think it won. Yeah. Mm. Uh, if it didn't run second, but, it, but I think it won. And uh, I'd said to you, "Say, what do you think?" Should I? I said, "I think you should offer uh, six hundred thousand pounds for it because you know we knew what the bad news were." And the uh, trainer said to Gay, "That's a very ballsy offer." Oh, he said, I don't think the owner thought about selling it, but that's a very ballsy offer. Uh, you know, if they, if the owner said it wasn't for sale, but it was beaten its next two starts and all of a sudden it was for sale and Gay bought it. Yeah, and uh, Lloyd Williams was a little bit involved in it and might well, have said he'd you tried got... To buy, he'd tried to buy it before and got the same answer as we did, uh -huh. but we just kept being in touch with it. When it got beaten, I suppose we still had interest in the horse, whereas yes. Lloyd may well have lost interest in the horse, but I, I don't know that. Yes. I, I know he was a bit crun uh, cranky with the bloodstock agent, uh, who was involved with it, uh, he felt he should have come back to him, which I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. And you end up paying $1.2 million Australian for it. That's what it says yeah, in the I, papers. Yes, I think we paid, end up paying £700,000 for it, uh, which was about that stage $1.2 million. Yeah. So why don't we watch? Let's watch it. Um, so were you, on, were you on course on this day or were you? Very good. So we've got the red arrow there showing us where it is. So. Yeah. And did you do you remember thinking here, this is going to shit in? Yeah, yeah. I, I, uh, Paddy, I saw the back. I did mark it six to four. You marked it six to four. Mm. Did you have? And Tom tried to back of the call the card. Yeah. Um, did you have a good crack at it? Well, it was a good result. Yeah. Were you book? Oh, you would have been bookmaking on course probably. Yeah. I oh, wasn't this day, Paddy. Not this well, day. Well, like, what had happened was I had been booking in, under Tom's name the uh, previous several years. And uh, Tom was at Com was sold to uh, William Hill, mm. and uh, we uh, and they wouldn't give me or sell me the book on course licenses, and they let them lapse, which I thought was a bit stupid. Yeah, right. And so I couldn't work that year. Yeah, which was good as it turned out. Yeah, I'm somewhere there in the crowd. Yeah, and did you notice that? I mean, Gay's obviously had hundreds of of wins. Did you notice that that was particularly special for her? Well, I must say I've been in racing all my life. And I regarded the um, the Golden Slipper as being the most important race, and if you win that, it becomes a stallion, and everyone says how fantastic he is, and 
it's a big process buying the best yielding and so mm. forth. But the Melbourne Cup's like five hundred dollars slippers. It's just such a yeah. has such a big impact on people. Mm. Uh, and uh, Gay Carrot had a trainers trophy for the next year, showing the all the time people have photographs taken, mm. which is quite funny, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And just quickly on the golden slippers, so you guys won it with Farn and back in yes, must be twenty twenty. Yeah. And the reason I just want to bring that up is some of the greatest racing content ever is you guys at your property. Yeah. Um, seems you've got that place down the Southern Highlands. Yeah. I think it is. Seems like you found your happy place down there, which is fantastic. But yeah. can you talk a little bit about was so you were there with Kate and her well, family? It was full, full of COVID times, wasn't it? Yeah. So we, we like literally they banned crowds from yeah. the races, and mm. two or three days later, ScoMo said mm. we're all in lockdown. Yeah. Did you guys end up there because you you sort of saw it coming and thought, well, if we're going to go in lockdown, we'd we'd rather be down here. Absolutely. How did is that how it transpired? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And look. Um, I realised the difficulties with it and I actually changed our official addresses to being down there yeah. so, so we could... Brilliant. Yeah. yeah. And did that... I, I presume that made it more bearable, the, the whole lockdown. Yeah, oh, yeah I, I suppose it did, but it was a, a, a waste of two years, wasn't it? Yes. In short. Yeah, yeah, sure. And sure. it might have been it might have been very foolish, might have. I'm, I'm looking forward to reading someone's study on it, but I suspect the, the Swedes got it right. Yes. Not, yeah, I, I probably... Do as well. It's very hard to know, but hard to know. Yeah. Mm. Um, so let's get back to the Melbourne Cup. Yes. Are we going to win the Melbourne Cup this year? I is Tim well, Waterhouse going to win the Melbourne Cup? Let's quickly watch this horse, this big grey horse, on Saturday, and then we'll have a good chat about it. So there he is, out in front, picking them up, putting them down. White Marlin, Charles pulls the stick at the 150, a length in front of Right You Are and Mankay and Late, but it's White Marlin, remains undefeated, and a Melbourne Cup journey starts here. White Marlin wins it by two lengths. There you go, the journey starts. I, I may have got it wrong, but I thought uh, on Saturday leaders did very poorly with the exception and horses near the fence did very poorly. Mm. So it was against the double bias. Yeah. Uh, and still went well, didn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I don't understand how a horse that has won two races in the UK. Yeah, they're pretty low races, a pretty awful race. Trained by Joseph O'Brien. Yeah, the top trainer. Is for sale and you can buy it online. Yes, well, they, thought, weird, they, they I, thought it was uh, hopeless uh -huh. and lucky to get the two wins. I think they regarded as winning at the picnics twice and they <laughs> found a mug from Australia. <laughs> the buy. <laughs> who also bought another horse from them, uh, the offer. I think she bought the offer from... From them as well, yeah. which they was a reject. Can you tell us how much <laughs> they paid for it, or is that? Uh, I think no, no, I don't mind telling you, but if I can get it right, I think we paid uh, two hundred or three hundred thousand euros for it. Yeah, which is got to, got to pay that sort of money to get those horses. But uh, look, the the times were sensationally fast on the day uh, that Irish meeting. I thought that yes, you know, So I, did you, you know, did you find it? Did you say to Gay? No, it was offered to us. Right. Uh, in fairness, Gay gets offered horses. Mm. All the time, mm. and I just keep rejecting them. But I wrote back straight away and said, uh, "Buy this one." Yeah, uh, but but I might have been wrong when it turned out as yeah. right. And you quickly found owners for it. Did you have to put a whole yeah, new set Kay, of owners in? has yes. Gay has no trouble finding owners for the, the staying horses. Is it going to win the Melbourne Cup? Well, I don't know. If she might have the first four in the betting of the Melbourne Cup, mind you. Yeah. yeah. Well, Goldman must be is the current favourite, mm. and Johan Ma. Hmm? I think White Marlin's now. Might favorite. be now after the yeah. Saturday's race. Yeah. But but uh, Yaha Mal, uh, it was bought for this year's Melbourne Cup. Did run second English Derby. Yeah. Uh, it might be a class above them. Yeah. And she's got the uh, ATC Derby or the Australian Derby winner. Yes. He might have come, come yeah, good. Absolutely. No, it was, it was a great win. Yeah. Um, and do you, does she still want to win the Melbourne Cup more than any other race? Yeah, because it's the one everyone loves, isn't it? Yeah. The one that you saw the other day. Um, uh, I'm not sure how it worked, but I assume that uh, last year's uh, winner, uh, they, the the syndicated company uh, Australian Bloodstock, owns the trophy. I assume, and they put it up for auction. I heard about this. And and uh, two of the owners bid on it. Mr. Black Caviar. Yeah. Exactly, but but they but it's got 160 or 200 thousand dollars worth of gold in it, uh, but. They've been to eight hundred. Took two to tango. You have to two bidders. Yes, got to eight hundred thousand. One true, gave yeah. in. Neil Warrett bought it. He did. Yeah. But but it, that, it is such an important. Yeah. It is such an important thing, isn't it? I yeah. think the people don't realise it. Yeah. The um, yeah. I think, I think it's quite extraordinary. The uh, just a funny thing. I sat beside one night, uh, dinner. Um, 
Susan Renouf or Susan Peacock or, uh, or Susan Rossiter, whatever you want to call her. And uh, she was telling me she'd sold quite a few paintings, Australian paintings she'd bought with Robert Sangster. And when they broke up, he said, take your rotten sticking paintings with you. And she sold one painting for two million, one for 1.8, one for one and a half. I said, have you got any other paintings left? She said, uh, no. She said, I've got a... I've got a Melbourne Cup. I said, that'd be worth 150000 She said 150000 be buggered. <laughs> worth a lot more than that. I said, oh, well, you know, I've seen a few of them sold. And she said, well, this one's special. I was, why is it special? She said, well, in 1940, uh, the owner's son inherited the Melbourne Cup and he sold it back to uh, Farlap, the owner of Farlap, oh. and sold it back to the VRC and they put it in their safe. They... In 1952, I think it was McDougal when it won, they got sticker shock at how expensive the cup was. They got the old Melbourne Cup out of the thing, brushed out Farlap, put down McDougal, and then they, the same thing happened with Bill Bow Ball. They, he wow. was the chairman of the VRC. He donated it back to the club, and, and it was became Bill Bow Ball's Cup. I expect yeah. it would be worth more than 800000 And it's... Uh, well, it's it yeah, she's sold. died, she's died, and the family obviously have it. But we need to find be, this cup. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I'm sure they know the story. Yeah. Yeah, because she a great was. Story. It is a good story, isn't yeah. it? Um, so, moving to probably a little bit more boring topic, but the the inquiry into online wagering last yeah. week in Canberra, did you did you sort of I, did you follow I, it on the day or I, you, I, you I didn't follow it? the day and people have told me about it, uh, and I understand totally your view and I can see your perspective and what else, but I must say the idea of uh, increasing limits for all the bookmakers is against the interests of ninety nine percent of punters. And, of course, would reduce turnover because bookmakers have to be more circumspect. And, of course, bad for bad for racing and bad for bookmakers. So as because you're a sort of mid-tier booker, so if they – because I've been pushing for a national bookies betting obligation, mm. you, would, you wouldn't be in favour of it and you think it would – Well, it's against the interests of 99%. If you uh, said whatever you offer, you've got to offer a certain amount on it, whether it's tiddlywinks mm. in, in Afghanistan, you've got to let people do it a certain amount. Well, of course, people won't bet. Offer those yes. betting on the tiddly Yeah, so or, it would stop you quality markets. You would absolutely, have to, yeah. yeah, and it stop all of them. I think, I think it's, I think you think it's the panacea a solution to the problems, but I suspect it's not. And aside from that issue, the government were talking about a lot of things, like in terms of like people having to verify their income and mm. things like that. Do you well, think racing is a little bit asleep at the wheel on that issue and probably need to? Well, they are, and they've been asleep at the wheel to allow them to have a, a register of people who. So once you ban yourself from one bookmaker, you're banned everywhere. Mm. Um, you know, people in the fit of peak say, I'm banning myself now. Yes. But don't realise it's hard Six to... Six months un- later, they, yeah. Yeah, it's hard to unban yourself. Yes. Uh, so, you know, I think it's a mistake. I was at Warwick Farm Races a couple of weeks ago and there were quite a few faces I hadn't seen for a long time. And I said to one of them, I said, look, why are you people all here today? What's happening? There must be a horse you want to back or something. Oh, he said... Uh, We've all been banned from the casino. I mm. said, "Why have you been banned?" He said, "Because they've they've said uh, we can't um, we, we have to prove our source of income, and you can't say you're a thief." Or <laughs> <laughs> well, that, then you definitely get banned. Yeah. Yeah. Well, gonna... perhaps perhaps you, they should. Perhaps perhaps, perhaps they. Uh, yeah. Well, I I don't understand the idea of banning people who earn their money illegally. They should be made to lose at the casino, shouldn't yeah. they? Sure. Um, yeah, it'll really be interesting to see what happens. And uh, Well, they bought it in England. It's been a major problem in England. And people have bet all their lives in certain ways. All of a sudden they're told by the betting shop, you know, you can't have £10 for cash on this thing until you can prove to us you can afford yeah, to which do is it. just crazy, isn't it? Well, it's, it seems very wrong to me. Phil Will wrote a, a great submission to the uh, Royal Commission into gambling in the 70s. And he said, paraphrasing what he said, that it's outrageous that um, very well-educated and upper-class people dictate to working-class people how they should spend their money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's just, just not right. Yeah. And robwardhouse.com, um, that's your... Yeah, well, it's it's going very well. We have a great service to people. We're, we're top odds, especially in the last 10 minutes of betting every runner. Uh, and uh, the business goes very well and we give a, do a great job with it. And how do you find the market, the betting market at the moment overall? Do you think that we're... I mean, I'm sure you're probably going to say we're overtaxed and... Well, the, the worst crime is the taxation on the punters because the punter pays it uh, and it's just too high. Mm. Um, 
I had a, a man come to my office, uh, I suppose three or four years ago now, uh, who I knew well and had met with me over a period of time. And he said, uh, Rob, uh, I've been banned by 12 different bookmakers. Mm. And I said, congratulations, I'm proud of you. I didn't know you were such a good punter. He said, I'm not, I've lost them all. Yeah. I've lost six and a half million in the last year and they've all banned me. Here are my records he yeah. gave me. He just so doesn't lose enough. He, he turned over 200 million. He lost over just over three and a quarter percent on turnover. He's got to lose six before they can yeah. take him on. Well, well, that man's lost to racing, isn't mm. it? So. I guess the counter, though, is that you go back to the late 80s and 90s and even the 70s where there was a lot of money in the totes yeah. and people were betting quite freely into sort of, let's say, roughly 116, 120% markets. And then we move into that the sort of the digital age where the corporates came and they could bet at mm. much lower percentages because they didn't have the impost of the product fees and taxes they have now. Now, look, I, I saw that uh, I got the tote figures, what they laid, what else, and you'd be amazed. The odd, the horses, they were over the odds of the bookmakers. They wrote lots of bets against. The, the horses, they were under the odds of the bookmakers. They never wrote a bet. This is back in the day? Back in the day. Yes. They, they never wrote a bet. Right. They just never wrote a bet. And, uh, and the on-course tote, I think you'd be surprised how little money they won or might have even lost yes. with their on-course patrons. I remember at, uh, I used to work at uh, Penrith Trots and they ran out of money there one night and I, the secretary came and I, I was very suspicious where they came and borrowed money from me. And I said, look, I just, the tote can't lose. How do you mean you're <laughs> short of money? He said, Rob, we've lost at every meeting for the last two years. Yeah. They're just too clever for us, these punters. Yeah. So, you know, I, I don't think it's quite people betting into the markets of 120% or whatever. So do you think the net effect, if race, you're basically what you're saying is the net effect of us having a lower taxing, taxation regime would generate more revenue well, in the long you, run? You, 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 uh, an economic student would explain to you whatever the punt has lost as a group in, in percentage terms, the reciprocal of that is how much turnover they've had. In other words, if they lose 20% on turnover, they can turn over their what's in their pockets five times. Mm. Mm -hmm. not, not one bet the total five times. If they lose 1% on turnover, they can turn over 100 times. They'll mm. still lose the money. Mm. Yes. But, but they'll get yeah. far more bang for it. Yes, yeah. And, and yeah. I think... More engaged. I, I remember when I was... I went and stayed with a friend of Dad's in Las Vegas when I was 14 or 15 and he had a casino downtown and he had a sign outside the casino saying these slots return 97%. And I didn't believe it. And uh, he said, oh, that's right, Rob, because... Whatever they've got in their pocket, they're going to bet. We'll win from them, but it might take them four hours. Yeah. Thanksgiving night, yes. New Year's Eve, we want them in and out in 20 minutes. We'll take out 50% and we get rid of them. <laughs> but we want them to enjoy themselves and yeah. stay for longer. Yeah. And that's the problem with racing. You actually want to give them more value for it. Yes. I think they'll lose the same amount of money. Yes, but if they get more enjoyment out of exactly. it. Yeah. yeah. Very good. And yeah. I suppose you should say that in England, um, I made a book at England at Ascot last year, and the tax we pay there is not based on turnover, it's based on how you go. Right. Which is how it should be. Which yes. should be our part. Gross profit, yeah. Yeah. Are you going to Ascot this year? I certainly am. So Animo's not allowed to go, but you are. Yeah, well, that's right. <laughs> I'm, I'm very versatile. Very good. And you're, sorry, you're bookmaking there. Yeah, yeah? bookmaking there. Yeah. And let's, let's finish on that note. So let's say in 25 years from now, if you're clear in the mind and in good health, will you yes. still be bookmaking at Ascot? Well, I don't know, say necessarily Ascot, but I most certainly like to be still bookmaking. Um, Bookmakers can keep going till, till they're a good age. My father won the award at the age of 90 as being the most improved bookmaker at uh, STC courses. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> <And so put> <laughs> <laughs> We've got the plaque at home. Uh, what, what year was it? Oh, Ten years ago or something. Yeah, like uh, very good. He, he, his last year's, but his turnover had gone up. Because obviously Tom was with him. Yeah. And he did the biggest increase in turnover in the year. And the STC yeah. gave him an award to most improved bookmaker. <laughs> excellent, excellent. <laughs> um, very good. Well, I think yeah. that's a, um, a great place to finish. Yeah. So yeah. thank you for being so candid. And yeah. um, I think people would have got good insight out of it. So um, if you haven't, go and sign up to robwaterhouse.com. Yeah. Come yeah. and sign up to Wolfden, get the tips off us, terrorise Rob. Yeah, terrorise me with Wolfden tips. Great way to go. All right. Thank you, everybody. See you next time.